So I'm really happy to be back here. A lot's happened in my life, and I know, bless you, a lot has happened in, in your lives as well. So um, for me, doing it yourself doesn't mean doing it alone. And in home ownership and in life, so let's tackle just that, that life part. I really believe that um, you, we cannot go through life alone. Obviously, that is what brought you girls here to Sisters You because you know, understand the power of having women support you and be by your side. So um, I totally buy in and support that whole concept. And for me, we all have a story. And Susan, your story was like really powerful. Um, and I have a friend who's been through similar things with drugs and, and prison time for her son. Um, and we all have our story. And for me, my story of why I got started on, on all of this path is that when I was 20, I moved out of my parents' house because for three years I was dealing with my mother having a mental breakdown. When I was 17, my mother had a hysterectomy and refused to get any follow-up medical care, and she snapped. Her whole personality changed. She became narcissistic, controlling. She was depressed, anxious. She was suicidal at times. And for to be a 20-year-old girl, 18-year-old girl, living in a home like that, dealing with your mother, threatening to take pills and drink, and you come home from you know, nursing school or work, and she's got pill bottles and wine jug next to the bed, I would do a breathing check on her before I would put myself to bed. And you get to a point that I could only take so much of that, and my life started to unravel to the point that a physician at the hospital pulled me aside one day and he goes, what's going on? You're not yourself. And he said to me in that moment, he's like, you need to get yourself together. You need to jump the ship. If your mother won't seek help, if your parents won't work together and support health as a family, you need to take care of you because nobody else will. Well, I moved out six weeks later. And I went into therapy and I took care of myself. But that was a really horrifying year. It was between my junior and senior year of nursing school. And I left home knowing I was not welcome back. So I lived paycheck to paycheck, 50 bucks a week, paying my own tuition, uh, working part time as a nurse and going to school full time. So it was a really difficult year, emotionally, financially, a lot of stress, but I got through it. And fortunately, my boyfriend at the time is now my husband of 23 years and he stood by me. Um, but you learn to be self-reliant very quickly when you're on your own at 21 years old. And I realized now, as I've been in this uh, entrepreneurial journey for the last five years, that I had this toolbox with me at a young age of things that got me through. And for me, the toolbox was you know, perseverance. It was humor that I had learned from my father. It was the ability to reach out to people and say, I need help. And, and not be afraid to share the story. Like you said, you can't walk up to people and say, yeah, my mom is a narcissistic crazy woman and I don't talk to her for 20 years. You don't just tell people that. Yeah. You know, you know I'm the only sane one out of the family. You know? But it's funny, though, because when that opportunity has opened up in conversations with other women, they're like, oh, my God, my mom is crazy, too. And you, you open up, but you share and you connect. And all of a sudden, you don't feel so alone. So that's what I mean. Doing it yourself, whether it's your self-improvement or your home improvement, you can't do it by yourself. So we have to open ourselves up. So let me open my toolbox for the home improvement side. What brought me to be a designer and a contractor was I was at home with three kids. I had time on my hands, believe it or not, because you, know, you can get stuff done with your kids around. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money because I'd given up my nursing job. So I taught myself electric, plumbing, drywall, carpentry, because I wanted my house to look a certain way, and I didn't have the financial resources to pay someone to do it. Nor was I really wanting to. I wanted that empowerment. I wanted to feel the connection to my home, because I expected to be in it a long time, and, and I am. My husband jokes. I'm like, till that pine box comes, I'm, this is it. I'm, this is my house. Um, so I went to Temple for Interior Design, and then became a licensed contractor and started teaching classes because too many women were asking me, how do you know how to do all this stuff? So that's when Hip Chicks rolled out, and it stands for Home Improvement Project Chicks. And it's all about teaching you guys how to be smart homeowners, how to be smart, capable, and confident, to be fearless, so that when something breaks, you're not panicked. You can kind of step back and go, oh, this is what I know. This is how I can solve it. And you know when you can handle it and when you can't. So I brought with me a, a bunch of goodies, some of my favorite tricks that will save you time, money, and stress. 
because for me, that is the focus of what I'm doing. And I was told I have to look at her and smile occasionally. Um, so I'm doing what I'm told. Um, so I'm going to start with a couple of my favorites. And let me just move on here. I don't know if you guys can even see what is going on in there. But here's my toolbox. Um, this is um, a photo of a toolbox that my uncle had given to my aunt his sister who was single when she got her first apartment. My uncle has since passed. He died at 44, very young, of lupus. Um, and that toolbox has been given back to me. And it's like a very, it's an important treasure because my uncle believed in empowering his sister. And I think that's pretty cool that he did that for her. So you need to have a toolbox. And the toolbox that you need to have, it's got to have some basics. You know, obviously you need a hammer, you need pliers, you know, um, you need duct tape. Yes, duct tape. You got it. Oh, you all sorts of purposes for that. Um, but my favorite tool in the toolbox has to be the drill. How many of you own a cordless drill? All right, that's a great number. Awesome. How many of you know how to use the drill? All right, that's pretty good. I get a lot of people go, it's still in the box, but it's in the garage. Um, this is my absolute favorite tool. And the reason is, is one, it saves your hand a lot of stress. Okay, it works quickly. I was just diagnosed with fibromyalgia, which is a whole nother thing. So I've had a lot of joint pain for the last year. So I'm, this is a godsend for me because I can get a lot done and not have pain. But it's important that you own one. So make sure you treat yourselves to a good drill, 18 volts. It can be a little on the heavy side, but 12 volts doesn't do anything. It doesn't have enough power. So go for 18 volts. Get yourself one that's got the removable battery. Make sure you have two batteries, because if you're like me, you forget to charge the one. And then you go to use the drill and it's dead. So I always have two batteries, so one is always powered up. The other thing that I love about it is that it is a versatile tool. I add this little gadget on the front. This gadget right here is called a magnetic drive shaft. It turns your drill into a screwdriver. So you pop this into the mouth of your drill and you tighten it up and then you go and you buy a little set of bits and you will have 30 different bits. You've got Phillips heads, you've got flat heads, that's the line. Um, you've got star <laughs> bits, you have um, squares, you've got all different shapes because when you have projects going on in your home, you have things that break. There's so many different screws and fasteners, and you need to have a variety of tools. You cannot have screwdrivers for every one of these, but you can have a little tiny kit that's got 30 different tips, and you pop it into here, and you can fix almost anything. Okay? So this is a really versatile tool. I love this. Um, really think everybody needs to, to own one. And Ryobi doesn't pay me to support them yet. They're on my target list. But I really like this brand from Home Depot. It's, it's a good price and it lasts and they have um, good warranties. So keep that in your toolbox. Okay, moving on from the toolbox to, I don't know if you can see me in my, my plunging <laughs> mode. I do have three boys and a husband, so you know we have toilet time. Um, oh, yeah. Although I can't tell you the last time I cleaned a toilet because they all have assigned bathrooms and I don't do it anymore, so it's really nice. Um, I fix everything in the house, but I don't have to clean it. So um, the toilet and clogs is a big topic of conversation every class that I teach. So let me show you a couple of my favorite little gadgets. Here is a toilet plunger, right? And you're like, yeah, I got one of those. But does your toilet plunger do this? Does your plunger have a little flange on the bottom? I hope it does. If you have a flat brown plunger, it doesn't work that well. You put it into the toilet and what happens? The air comes up the sides, right? You need the one with the flange because it pushes that air down into the neck of the toilet and really pushes the air towards the clog, which is the goal in the first place. So treat yourself to a new plunger. <laughs> um, and here's my other little tip, design tip. This is not art. No one wants to see it in your bathroom. No one wants to see it in the corner. We all know where it's been, you know? So my best advice is that you take a moment and rinse it off when you're done, put it in that grocery bag, and tuck it under the cabinet, put it in the hall closet, wherever, but don't leave it out. Unless 
you've got that relative, Uncle Buck, coming for the weekend, and you know inevitably he will ask for it, then you just leave it out and it saves you both a lot of embarrassment. So um, my father-in-law will be staying at my house this week. My husband and I are going away, and it will be left out. So, um, because he'll be asking my kids, where's your mom put the plunger? So this is a sink plunger. Isn't this cute? I think this thing is so cute. This is a sink plunger. It's $2.98. You really need to own one of these little guys. Why I love it is because that is thick and hard, and that rubber is hard to get into the sink bowl. This is small and compact, and it's flexible. It's like an old Atari game. Or for those of us that still drive a manual, it's like a manual transmission. So it's so versatile because you can use it on your sinks, you can use it on tubs, showers, and garbage disposers. Okay? Honestly, you don't want to take that plunger and put it in those other locations. Okay? The nurse in me is saying, let's keep the poo germs separate. Okay? So get yourselves one of these little guys. They're really powerful, compact, and super easy to use. Okay? So get one of these. Um, one tip that I have to remind people is that never, ever use liquid drain cleaners in a garbage disposer. I know people who have tried to do that, and two reasons. One, the chemicals can break down the components in the disposer, and secondly, um, the splashback. Okay, there's a lot of toxic lye in those chemicals, so you really want to make sure that you're careful. All right? Not a big fan of, of drain cleaners, but. All right, moving on to another clog product, which I love, and I see a number of gals in here with long hair, is the Zip It Stick. Who owns one? A couple of you? This is a great product. It is $2.98. That's like my magic numbers. $2.98 from Home Depot. And it is a drain cleaning tool. It goes down into your drain. It's 18 inches long. It's got little spikes up and down. Made in the USA, which is really cool. And you drive it down into... Oh, it's Karen. Hi, Karen. You drive this down into your drains, and it will pull up a really disgusting blob of hair. I'm warning you, it is gross, okay? You'll pull up a disgusting blob of hair, pull it off with a paper towel, and then rinse this, and then I slide it right back in the package, and I use it again. Well, it says it's one-time use. I'm like, it's hard plastic. So, You'll, you, yeah, just like, how bad is it before you want to clean it? How bad? Um, it's gross. It's gross. It's like a little rodent coming out of your drain. It's disgusting. It's that bad, you know? So the point is, you want to do this like once a month because this way it prevents you from having that dreaded moment when you're taking a shower and you look down and you're standing in your own filth and you're like, this is disgusting. I need to do something. Take the zip it stick and sweep your drain. Then I'm going to give you a drain cocktail in a second. So if you want to reuse this and you go to take it out of the package a few weeks later, please make sure that you open it up and you check that it's really pliable because you don't want it to break off in the drain. So if it feels at all brittle, buy a new one, okay? Don't use it because you'll hate me if it breaks off and you'll be like, she didn't warn me. So now if you have taken out that big blob of stuff from your drains, it's time for a cocktail. And the cocktail is baking soda and vinegar. So what I want you to do is pour, for those of you that are, you know, OCD, one cup of <laughs> baking soda. I don't measure anything. I'm really bad. So um, pour some baking soda down into the drain. I often take a piece of paper, make like a little funnel so I can kind of get it right down in there. Because you don't want it just sitting in the bowl. You want it down into the drain. So. Pour some baking soda in. You're going to follow it up with equal parts of vinegar. It is instantly going to start fizzing up, okay? Then you want to close the drain because you want to contain that little science experiment so that all of that energy will work on the clock, okay? So let it sit about 10 minutes. Come back with a kettle full of hot water, boiling water. Pour that down. It disinfects, it deodorizes, and it gets rid of all that other scum that's left inside the drain. It's non-toxic. It costs you pennies. It's super easy to do. So what I'll do is I'll go around and I'll sweep the few drains. I'll do my shower, the boys' bathroom, 
um, and the three upstairs sinks. And then get the kettle going, and I just do baking soda, baking soda, and I kind of just go around and then come back in 10 minutes and just hit everybody with some um, boiling water, and the drains are clean. And it prevents problems. So it's something you could do three, four times a year and keep yourself from calling a plumber. Do you know the average plumber call in the state of Pennsylvania? Buck 25. Is that, that about where you were going to say? Yeah. $125 for an average plumber call. It's a lot of money. That's just to show up. Hey, by the way, it's going to be five hundred dollars. Yes, you know, and, and you know, we're not picking on, on Shauna's family that are plumbers, but <laughs> we got to put food on her table. But um, the point is, though, that there are so many things that we can do that are simple and quick that we can rectify on our own because plumbers don't want to come out for this piddly stuff. They want big jobs where they're going to spend three or four days you know, um, replumbing a master bath. They don't want to come out and deal with, you know, little, you know, little Susie's clog. So keep that in mind. You really want to empower yourself to take care of the little stuff, okay? So moving on from the potty, I want to talk to you about hammering. I want to talk to you about hanging things because a lot of women get hung up on hanging things on walls. I don't know how many homes I've been to where I go in and somebody has a piece of art sitting on the floor leaning there, oh yeah, I'm waiting for my husband to hang that. What are you waiting for a man to do that for? It's a hammer. It's a nail. Maybe it's a, it's a screw-in anchor. We can do this. And I say this with all sincerity and humor. If we can give birth to a human, we can fix a toilet, we can hang art, we can do these other things. And I think we have to step back sometimes when we get a little anxious because there's something new that we haven't done before and we're like, oh, I can't. Why the hell can't you? That's my attitude. Like, don't tell me I can't. I'll figure it out. So I want you to just get into that mindset, okay? I had no idea how to produce YouTube videos, no idea how to produce a TV pilot, no idea how to edit. I do all of this stuff now. Five years ago, I was stay-at-home mom. That was it. And now I've accomplished these other things. You figure it out. You ask questions. So I want you to do the same. Um, so I brought a little wall with me. Um, I teach at Bucks. I teach a five-week home repair class at Bucks. Um, it starts, I think, in a week and a half. Um, it's often sold out, so I don't even know if there's any seats left. But um, I bring a big wall with me, and I have all of the girls practice putting in wall anchors because wall anchors seem to be a big concern. So let's talk studs for a minute. And whenever I mention that at home, my husband's like, I'm right here. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, we talk about studs. So um, our only stud tonight is Joe. So hats off to Joe. Edit that part out so Brenda won't see. Yeah, no, but he's a brave man showing up into a room with all these women. Um, at the class I taught at Bucks, I think two semesters ago, I had 19 ladies and one man. And Bob was a sweetheart. I said to Bob, I'm like, are you like trying to look for a date? He's like. Hey, if it happens, you know, he was really cute. He was about like mid 60s. He was funny. Um, so let's talk studs for a minute. You know, the studs are the vertical beams in your walls, right? How far apart are studs? 16 inches, exactly. That means theoretically, the center of one stud to the center of the other should be 16 according to building code. But every wall in your house is not a multiple of 16, is it? So on one end or the other, it's going to be less than 16. But you don't know which end, do you? Yeah, stud finders. Stud finders are great. So stud finders are great. They've really advanced. I love it. Beep, beep. And then you're like, I know there's no stud there. Why is it beeping? So it's a great tool to help you in the process of finding a stud. But I want to show you a couple other tricks that will help you think through that process. Whenever you have a door or a window, you have a stud holding it up. So you can work off of the door, work off of the window, and start to measure out that way. I want you sometimes to get down on your hands and knees and look at your baseboards, your chair rail, or your crown molding. Because if your carpenter was a little bit sloppy, you'll see a nail head. And that's where the stud is, because that's where the baseboards, the crown, or the chair are attached to the wall through the stud. Mm -hmm. So you can get down and look for those little nail holes, OK? And that'll be one time you're happy your contractor was a little sloppy, because it helps you find stuff. The other thing that does work, and it sounds really goofy, is um, a men's electric razor. If you take a men's electric razor and you hold it against the wall, like, you know, bristle right to the wall, the sound changes 
over the studs versus over the dead space. So it's another clue to help you find the stud. And then the last thing is that your electrical outlets and switches, the boxes are attached to studs. So you can often take the cover off. Don't go sticking screwdrivers in. Oh but you can peek sometimes off to the side and you'll see the stud where the box is attached to the wall. So then again, you can then count 16 off of that. So these are just little clues to kind of help you figure out where these things are hiding in the wall. So the first class I taught um, that I had a, a gentleman in, he must have been about 55 and we're, I was talking about studs. And he stopped and he said, Beth, is the stud something in the wall? And I thought, you know what? I have to remind myself of my nursing training. You have to assume that that patient or that homeowner knows nothing. You got to figure out what do they know before you can go on to teach them what they should know. So I had to step back. That's when I built my little portable wall that I take to the classes. So we can talk headers, footers, studs, joists, and all that stuff. But it's important to, any time you're speaking to someone, what is their knowledge base so that you know where you're talking from and where you go. So next thing I have to show you is this little gadget. I'm sure some of you have used the wall anchors that have like the little butterfly thing that expands inside the wall. They're such a pain, those molly bolts or toggle bolts. Hate those things. So I love these. These little gadgets are called Easy Anchors. Twist and Lock is, is the brand. They're fantastic. These little gadgets are plastic. They have a Phillips head tip and they screw right into your drywall. And I would do this with the drill on a real wall. I'm just using the, the old hole for, for speed. And then after you have that anchor screwed into the drywall, you take the screw, which is gonna be used to go right in if you wanna hang maybe a piece of art with a, a wire on the back. Or maybe if you want to um, hang like a toilet paper holder, you'd have like a bracket that would go on the wall here and you would drive the screw through the bracket into the anchor, okay? This is awesome because once this goes through on the back side, it cracks the plastic open. So it's twisting into the drywall for one grab and then it cracks open on the back side. So you've got two points of grab, so it's much more secure. You know, have you ever bought something from Bed Bath & Beyond or Target and they come with the little torpedo wall anchors? They're gray, white, red, you've seen them. Throw them out. They're useless because after a while, those things just come right back out of the wall. So save yourself time. Buy yourself a little bucket of twist and lock easy anchors and replace all of those other ones that come with your product with those and it'll be on the wall, it'll stay and you won't have big holes in the wall a year from now, okay? The garbage disposer is a big ticket repair item. And you can, you know, Shauna, it's, again, you, do you want to spend $125 for the guy to come in and fix this if you can try it on your own? So here's a few things I want you to do. When you flip the wall switch and you hear the grind, but nothing's chopping, that means you have power, right? You have an obstruction. So do not go like this, okay? <laughs> Do I do it? Yeah, I'm guilty sometimes. But um, I always tell people, use your non-dominant hand if you're going to be stubborn. <laughs> Just so you don't cut the wrong fingers, you know? Um, but seriously, there's blades in there. They're like the tilt-a-whirl ride, OK? They're like on a pivot. So if something is stuck inside of there, and you put your fingers in and you pull it out, there's still stored energy. When the thing is released, the blades could spin. Just be smart, OK? Use tongs. I've seen people use a broom handle, which I don't quite get. It's kind of big. Um, but tongs are great. Just go in there and try to retract whatever's stuck. But every one of you needs to own this. Have you seen this before? The disposer wrench. 298, magic number. This is a little wrench. It's basically an Allen wrench. And it fits into the underside of your disposer. And you can move the blades forwards and backwards to dislodge what is stuck in between the blades. So for three bucks, you get under there, you kind of loosen things, and you can free up what's stuck oftentimes. So now you would come back up, you turn on the water, you flip the switch, you try to see if you can get whatever was stuck to move. If you know it's an object, retrieve it before you try to just turn it on, okay? So if you have determined that you have no power, you flip the wall switch and nothing happens. We all flip it six more times because it's miraculously <laughs> going to happen, right? So 
The next thing I want you to do is I want you to reach to the underside of the disposer again. Off from center is a red button. This is a reset button. Your disposer has a built-in circuit breaker. So you can reset this button, hold it for, you know, seven or eight seconds. It's often enough to reset the motor. Now come back up, turn on the water, flip the switch, and see if it's powered up. Is that easy? Yeah. Do you really want to pay 125 bucks to a man to push your buttons? No. 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 You don't. No. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Only your dad? Is that what you said? <laughs> you can pay her father. Um, but seriously, this is a simple thing that you can rectify in minutes. Imagine you're going to call your girlfriend and say, hey, I need a good plumber, if you don't already know Shauna, who is a family of plumbers. But you're going to call your girlfriend. So you're going to Facebook it, right? And then you wait two days. And then he's going to call or he's going to come out. And in the meantime, you're going without your disposer. You've got dishes backing up because, you know, you're afraid to wash stuff and get things clogged. I want you to try these simple little things. Now, if you have tried the reset button and you still don't have success, the next thing for you to do is to go to the circuit breaker box in the basement, garage. Everybody know where their breaker box is? Yes. Okay. So I want you to go to your breaker box and I want you to see if the breaker has tripped. But just because a breaker trips, sometimes they pop back that on a visual inspection, it looks like it's on. It looks like they all line up. So I want you to take your hands and just push so that you feel that they're all in a locked position. Bless you. It doesn't mean you turn them all off on on, because then you're going to reset every clock and you'll be miserable. But just push against them to make sure that they feel snug. You'll feel a wiggly um, breaker if one has tripped and has not fully reset. Now again, you can do this. If this has not turned it back on, then you call the plumber. And you say to him, I have checked the breaker. I have checked the circuit breaker. I reset it underneath. I still have nothing. Then he can say to you, great, what size disposer do you want? He's not going to have to come out, troubleshoot, and then leave, and then go and get. Have that conversation. So he knows walking in, you can ask right up front, what will the price be to replace my disposer? Exactly. It could be $238. Um, I call them my chicks. Um, one of my chicks was telling me um, in a class that she had a garbage disposer that was loose underneath, like between the, the sink and the disposer, the gasket was loose and she had a leak. So she called the plumber in. He was in her house for 12 minutes. He brought in a big wrench. He tightened the gasket on the underside. He charged her $300. She was insecure, she's very timid, she didn't know any different, and she wrote a check. That's why she took the class of bucks. And now she just bought a house and she's asking everybody, so how much is that going to cost and what is, how long is that going to take? But she's asking the questions, so I want you to think that way too and ask the questions, all right? Again, don't pay people to push your buttons, okay? This is easy, this is simple. This is a way for you to troubleshoot and have a good conversation with the pro before he shows up at your house. Moving on to um, another electrical um, item, and that is the GFI, or as I call them, the funky little outlets with the reset buttons. Um, do you all know where these are in your home? Does everyone have them? Some older homes don't. Okay. The GFI, or GFCI, is a ground fault interrupter um, outlet. It's designed to help prevent shocks where there is water. So bathrooms, laundry rooms, um, uh, kitchen. It could be a, a garage if you have a hose bib in your garage. It could be any number of spaces that have potentially um, water on the floor. So the trick is understanding that just because you have one of these in your, um, all right, so you've got one in your kitchen, but you don't have one in your bathroom. Your bathroom wiring could be wired to the one in the kitchen. Keep in mind that one circuit breaker could have seven, eight, even nine switches and outlets on the same current so that when one trips, multiple things trip. So I was on the phone with a girl um, 
we were talking one day and she said to me, I have this outlet in my bedroom that has not worked in about two years. <laughs> you have one too? And I, I said to her, okay, while we're on the phone, I said, I want you to go find the funky little outlets with the reset buttons. And she goes, oh yeah, I've got one here. And while we're talking, and she reset all three of them. And now the outlet in her bedroom worked. You need to go and find these, okay? Some of them, like this one, lights up. Yeah, yeah. Some of them, um, some of the, the older ones don't have um, light indicators. Some of the really old ones, but the newer ones all have a light indicator, so it'll turn red when it's tripped. Okay. Sometimes the GFI goes bad, and that everything past the GFI is not working, and you have to replace the GFI. But I want you to investigate. If you could reset this and turn that switch back on, or not, a, it's not typically not switch, it's other outlets. Wouldn't that be great? And you didn't have to call the plum, or call the electrician for that, mm -hmm. all right? Because their prices are about 100 per hour mm -hmm. just to walk in the door. So keep that in mind. It's a very easy, simple thing to do, all right? Um, one other tip. If you ever have outlets in your house that are wiggling in the box, you have some of those? that when you take the plugs in and out, the whole box wiggles. It's really important that you take the switch plate cover off. And at the top and the bottom of the outlet is a screw that attaches it to the box. You want to tighten those screws. And I'll tell you why. About three years ago, my son was up doing homework in his room and he yells, Mom, come here, the lights are acting up. Okay. I go up into his room and they're blinking slowly. Okay, I walk into my room. Two lights in my room are blinking slowly. Then all of a sudden, it's like a disco. Okay, I'm seriously, it's like, whoa, lights are blinking, and then it stops. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? So I go to the breaker box. All the circuits are on. Everything was on. But my husband is an engineer, and he made me, when we built our house, map every single outlet and switch in our house to a diagram of the property with S's and O's. And, and I laughed at him 20 years ago, and I'm so grateful that he was that anal because we have this beautiful diagram of our house's electrical system. So I was able to go right to the breaker that operated my son's room and three outlets in my room, and I turned the breaker off and I went to bed. No power was on, I could go and sleep. The next morning I woke up and I started opening up the outlets on that circuit, the outlet in the wall behind my son's dresser, I opened up the outlet. The whole side of the um, outlet was melted. What had happened was the wires that were put into the back of the outlet when the house was constructed, and then the wire on the side, which then piggybacks the energy onto the next outlet, the wires had come loose because the outlet was loose. And the current arced back and forth, back and forth between the wires, melting the plastic. It shut itself off. It did what it was supposed to do, and it shut itself off. So therefore, I further shut it down by turning off the breaker and going to bed that night. I replaced the outlet. Everything was fine. But if you have those outlets, if you have weird flashing and you can't explain it, I don't mean flashing because somebody turned on um, the garage door, you know, and the lights dim, or the dishwasher cycles, or the washing machine. That's all normal if you have another thing that is a big power draw. But if you can't explain why you've got weird random flashing on a particular circuit, bring in a pro. You want to investigate that, okay? You want to make sure you don't have a fire hazard sitting in the wall in your kid's room, because that was a little disturbing. So, um, but fortunately, I was able to go buy a $4 outlet, and 30 minutes later, it was fixed. So. Um, I know all of you aren't that ready to tackle electrical. So um, I put in two um, light fixtures today. And I tell you, the hardest part of doing electrical work is attaching the stupid fixtures to the ceiling. Not the wiring. The wiring took me two seconds. The hardest part was trying to hold the thing and line up the screws and get it to fit. You know, right. And then the, the um, fiberglass insulation's hanging out. And I'm like trying to stuff it back in. It was total pain. Um, I always like to show this product when I teach because there's a lot of women that take my classes and a lot of women that often live alone. And I think this is a great product for you to have. This is um, one in a, in a series of products. This is called a motion-activated light control. 
It's a really cool gadget that allows you to have motion lights at your property without electrical work. It screws into your porch lights and you put the light bulb into the bottom. So instead of having to bring the guy out, run the lines and you know, have this big expensive system installed, you literally take the light bulb out of your porch lights, you screw this in, it has a 360 degree range for motion sensing, put the bulb down in the bottom and if somebody approaches your door, the lights come on. So it's a way to deter any trouble it also will chase the deer away if they're eating your evergreens at your door because I live near woods and in the middle of the night we'll see the lights on and we do have floodlights in the back on a motion sensor and I'll go and they're all eating my greens I'm banging on the glass to get them to leave. Um, but this is a really great product. It's about $15. And if you could feel more secure and also think about your senior parents that are living alone in their own home still, this is great to have at entryways because they now can see clearly steps, they can see ice. You know, it's really just a great gadget and it doesn't require any electrical work. So you can do this very inexpensively and quickly without any stress. Um, there's also one that is from dawn to dusk. So you can put it in your porch lights and it just turns them on and off, um, you know, in the evening and off in the morning. And the well-lit home is less interesting to trouble than the dark home. So it's just a matter of keeping yourself safe. So um, love these little gadgets. Oh, also great for garages and basements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you can't get to that switch and you have to tiptoe a couple steps into the dark before you get to it. This is a great solution to keep you safe um, in there. So I have three more tools. You can't buy them at Home Depot. The first one is education. It is imperative that you educate yourself about how to take care of your property. It is the biggest investment of your life. It's the biggest investment of your life. It's your children's inheritance. You know, think about all that goes into that property. You need to take care of it. So I want you to read. I want you to talk to the guy in, you know, the aisle at the home center. I want you to watch my YouTube videos. No. Um, I want you to watch TV, watch videos, and I want you to learn. Because once you understand how things work, you're able to handle more yourself and have an intelligent conversation with a pro when he does come to your house. Okay? Because I don't want you paying $300 to have the gas get on the um, disposer tightened. The next um, tool that you need is skill. And I have a picture of a turkey because we all understand as women what it's like to have that first turkey dinner. Oh. <laughs> and the skill that went into perfecting it from year one where it wasn't so hot to year 10 where you can put on a mean spread. So my aunt always tells me about the first time she did um, Thanksgiving, she left the giblets inside the cavity. <laughs> turkey didn't turn out so well. Now, you know, 34 years later of being married, my aunt's a fabulous cook. So we all need skill. So I want you to try things. I want you to try them. You're going to screw up a little bit. It's okay. If I screwed up as a nurse, I could have killed somebody. If I screw up on the drywall, you buy spackle. Okay? Like it's not the end of the world. I can understand electric might scare you a little bit, some plumbing, but start small steps. Take baby steps, but practice. Try things. Okay? You'd be surprised what you can accomplish. And send me pictures of what you do because it just makes my day. Um, and lastly, you got to have courage. Um, this, my father and I watched this movie together every year when I was little. Like, this was his guy. Um, we need courage. And we often forget all the stuff that we've been through. Like you said, you know, you, you thought what you went through before 27 was tough, you know. And then, you know, you hit 60 and you realize all the other things you've dealt with. So these things around our house... You know, the toilet is an inanimate porcelain object bolted to the floor. Hello, can we handle that, okay? So think about it, keep it in perspective, and pat yourself on the back for all the other crap that you've accomplished in life and you've dealt with and you've succeeded, and know, I can do this. This is not so insurmountable that I can't handle this. And lastly, I want you to flush your fear. I want you to flush the fear of the things that come up in life that scare you, whether it's the house, whether it's taking the job, whether it's going on the date, whether it's whatever it is. We need to let go of fear. 
because there are people waiting to help us. There's people on the other side waiting to scoop us back up and put us back together. And um, I really think we can accomplish incredible things when we just let go of the fear and we just jump. So I hope that you all do that. And literally, um, I've done this exercise and I have asked people to take a square of toilet paper and write down on a square what is the one thing in life that is holding them back right now and then I want you to ceremoniously stand before the toilet. I'm serious. Stand before the toilet, look at it, and flush it. And it's really very cathartic. So I'll end on that. So thank you all very much.